So yeah, thanks a lot of, uh, for uh, having me. Um, sorry, I'm gonna talk about a very recent work about the relation between correlation intractability uh, and one-way functions. So let's just begin. Uh, cool, so our motivation starts with public coin protocol. Uh, so these are uh, simply proof systems uh, where all the, all the verifier does is just generate random strings and send them to the verifier, uh, to the prover. And only at the end, he does some uh, verification procedure uh, given that transcript. Uh, and he either accepts or rejects. Um, so this is a very simple and canonical form of uh, proof systems, but it's still very powerful. So using public one protocols, uh, we can get uh, zero knowledge for NP, we can delegate computations, and we can even prove a membership in very uh, uh, hard uh, languages. Uh, but these protocols are still uh, interactive, right? So, um, and interaction in, in many scenarios, especially in the real world, uh, is very undesirable. Uh, and by the way, interaction in this talk is super desirable. So please feel free to ask uh, whatever, whatever question you have in mind. Uh, so um, with, the, uh, with the goal uh, of um, um, getting rid of interaction in a public coin proof system, um, Amul Sriat and Adi Shamir proposed this very uh, simple idea of uh, turning a public coin protocol into a non-interactive protocol using some hash function. Uh, and the idea is that the prover can simulate uh, the interaction with the verifier uh, by computing the verifier's challenges uh, using this hash function. So instead of waiting for the verifier to, um, to send him a random string, he would just uh, compute this string as uh, the hash of the transcript he has generated so far. Okay, and this way he can compute the entire transcript and send it at once to the verifier. So we don't have interaction right now. Cool, uh, so let me just focus on the case where we have three messages and the hash function is applied only once, but uh, anything I'm gonna say is gonna apply to the general case, at least in the case where we have a, um, a constant number of um, Cool, so uh, good, we have an interactive protocol, but this is not the only thing we need. Uh, we need, of course, some properties out of uh, this uh, a proof system, uh, we typically uh, require completeness, soundness, and maybe, I don't know, zero knowledge and uh, some other properties. And uh, usually uh, many of these properties are easy to show that they're maintained in the Fiat Shamir transform. And the main concern with uh, Fiat Shamir uh, is soundness. So it's not clear that uh, even if we start with a public coin proof system, uh, we end up with a sound uh, protocol. And the reason is that we start with the protocol which is sound, but it's not perfectly sound. We still have some uh, soundness error. So for any uh, first message uh, that the prover send uh, alpha, there might be some set of bad challenges, uh, which I'm gonna call uh, the bad challenges uh, for alpha, uh, that may allow the prover to cheat. And uh, if we wanna be more formal then these challenges, uh, there are the challenges uh, uh, for which there exists some gamma, such that the uh, verifier, uh, uh, accept the transcript, even though the uh, instance is not here. I'm hearing lots of noise, maybe we can. Okay. And somebody had to mute. Cool, thanks. Yeah, now no, uh, I don't have anything. Thank you. Uh, cool. So again, uh, 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 any uh, uh, public one protocol uh, defines some implicit relation between first messages uh, alpha and bad challenges corresponding to alpha. And these are the challenges that introduce the sound zero. Um, so our main question here is which hash functions we should use with the Fiat in order to get a sound uh, Fiat Shamir transform. And I hope you can uh, somehow believe uh, following what I just uh, showed you that if we can claim that it's hard uh, to find an input for the hash such that uh, this input and its hash satisfy this relation between a first message and the bad challenge, then uh, it's hard to uh, break the soundness of the protocol. Because if uh, I could break the soundness, then I uh, uh, would have found such an alpha. Cool. So now we know what we exactly need for some Fiat Shamir. So now we start asking, how do we do that? Uh, and what happens in the uh, real world in uh, practice, um, you know, people would use uh, 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 cryptographic functions that we believe are sufficiently unstructured. Uh, so examples are AES or SHA-2, 
Uh, and uh, we, uh, the belief is, or the, the heuristic is that uh, if these functions are uh, uh, sufficiently messy, then they do satisfy this hardness uh, requirement. And the, the justification uh, for this um, approach is that if we actually replace uh, the hash function with a totally random function, so we, if, if we model H as a random oracle, then indeed we do get soundness uh, using Fiat Shamir. Good. So um, although this justifies uh, somehow using uh, any cryptographic function, we still have some gap. Uh, uh, and in particular, we know that there exists some argument system. So this is a, uh, uh, a protocol with computational soundness, uh, where even though uh, a random oracle gives us a Fiat Shamir, which is sound, uh, we know that there exists no uh, real efficiently computable hash function uh, that can give us sound Fiat Shamir. So this introduces uh, some, ga uh, some gap, which we want to close. So uh, again, our goal is to, uh, to ask whether um, there exists a Fiat Shamir uh, for any uh, proof system. If so, then uh, under which cryptographic assumptions? And it's not even clear that we actually need cryptography or some uh, weaker uh, notion of hardness. So uh, with these uh, questions in mind, and in order to put some formal framework to this entire uh, line of uh, research, uh, 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 Ran and Goldreich and uh, uh, Halevi, they introduced this notion of correlation interactability. Um, so we say that a hash function that takes as input a key, k, and uh, uh, an input and output a hash, is correlation interactable for some relation. So this uh, uh, notion of hardness is dependent on a relation. So we say that H is correlation interactable for a, re a relation R. If it's hard to find an input for the hash uh, that satisfies the relation together with its, with its hash under some random uh, key. So the correlation interactability game is as follows. Um, the challenger samples a random a hash key and it sends it to the, uh, 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 to the adversary. And the adversary has to, uh, uh, to uh, output uh, an alpha such that alpha and uh, the hash of alpha under k satisfy the relation. And hopefully you can uh, see now that we can uh, get a sound fiat Shamir uh, for any protocol if we have correlation interactable hash for the, re the relation that we defined before. And this is the relation between first messages and bad challenges. And the way to get this uh, fiat Shamir transform is simply to sample a random hash key in the common reference string. And now uh, the, uh, the verifies challenge is computed as the hash of the first message under the key. So it's easy to see that if, the, uh, if an adversary can break the soundness of uh, the transform, then he can break the correlation tractability uh, of the hash for this specific relation, the bad challenge relation. Any questions? Cool. Okay, so... Now we reduced our, our goal from constructing Fiat Shamir to uh, getting correlation tractable hash. Uh, and now we ask whether we can get correlation tractable hash for any such a uh, bad challenge relation. So let's see what's known so far. So we know if we uh, want to assume uh, super strong uh, cryptography, so uh, I owe some other uh, assumptions or uh, optimal KDM security, uh, then we can get correlation tractability for all sparse relations. So these are relations where for every alpha, there are uh, negligibly few uh, betas uh, such that alpha and beta are in the relation. Okay, and this is indeed satisfied in, um, in, uh, in the bad challenge relation of a proof system uh, because we have uh, a negligible sound error. So again, uh, using uh, such assumptions, we can get correlation tractability for all sparse relations. And what this gives us, this gives us a single hash function that can be used for uh, sound Fiat Shamir for all proof systems. So this is some kind of a universal Fiat Shamir hash. Good. But this, this straightforward approach is stuck here. We, we cannot uh, get something similar with a weaker assumption. And the reason for that is that this uh, bad change relation is usually too complicated to understand, uh, let alone to construct correlation tractability for. So uh, what uh, known uh, and very useful construction uh, constructions uh, uh, um, uh, usually do is they uh, go through some relaxation where they say, okay, we cannot construct correlation tractability for uh, this very complicated relation, but what we can do is we can construct correlation tractability for simpler, simpler relations, but our hash function satisfies correlation tractability 
for a class of simple relations simultaneously. So what does that mean? We so a correlation tractability for a class of relations simply requires that the hash is correlation tractable for all relations. So it's hard for all relations uh, for, an, uh, for an adversary to win this uh, correlation tractability game. And one can think of the game uh, as follows. So the, it's not uh, quite equivalent, but uh, just to simplify things, uh, we can think that the adversary first chooses a relation from the class that he wants to attack, and then he gets a key, and only then he should out, uh, uh, output a correlation. Okay. So he kind of commits to the relation before seeing the key. Uh, good. Um, um, okay, so let's see uh, what we can get using this uh, uh, approach. So using uh, asymmetric crypto with uh, which satisfies some uh, uh, strong functionalities. So for example, uh, full homomorphic encryption or trapdoor hash, we can get correlation tractability for simple classes of relations, which are still very useful for applications. So for example, we get correlation tractability for all uh, uh, relations that we can efficiently uh, compute. Uh, and this gives us, for example, non-interactive zero knowledge for NP. And uh, these assumptions, we can get understand that assumptions such as uh, DDH, LWE. Okay. Uh, cool. Uh, in this work, I'm gonna focus on even weaker crypto. My focus is going to be uh, what happens in mini crypto in a world where we only assume one-way functions. Uh, and for now, no strong correlation tractable hash is known. So all correlation tractable, tractable hash functions that we know how to construct from one-way functions are pretty useless. They give us no applications uh, for fiat to me. So uh, that, the two main questions I'm going to ask today is first of all, can we do more in uh, Minicrypt? Can we uh, base interesting correlation tractability on one-way functions? And second of all, I'm asking whether uh, symmetric key cryptography is even necessary. Okay, we even don't know uh, whether all of these assumptions are necessary to get correlation tractability. Good. So what I'm essentially asking is about this relation between correlation tractability, which is sufficient for some Fiat Shamir, which is pretty central in uh, computer science, and uh, one-way functions, which represents uh, this entire world of uh, symmetric key crypto. So let me tell you a little bit what is known about uh, this relation. So first of all, like I already mentioned, uh, we know that using one-way functions, we can get uh, useless uh, notions of correlation tractability. But this is not very interesting. We also know that if our goal is to construct universal fiat Shamir, so if we want a single hash function uh, to work with all proof systems, uh, then uh, cryptography is necessary for this task. Okay, so we know that uh, universal correlation tractability uh, implies one-way function. Another thing we know is that um, Fiat Shamir so, for- yes. so, qu Question. So yeah. you say universal, I mean, how universal or are you gonna get to that later? In what exactly is universal? No, I'm not gonna, so let me tell you now because I'm, I'm not gonna talk about it uh, later. So correlation tractability for some uh, small yet still expressive class of sparse relations. Okay. okay which is uh, represented by a uh, universal hash function. Okay. Is so, yeah. So, 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 so what is this class of relations or, 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 or any, class, um, any, any class of relations that is satisfies something? Yes, yes. Um, I don't have the minimal requirements right now in my uh, head, but uh, we can talk about it later. Right. But yeah. definitely, all sparse relations suffice. Um, okay. But it's a subset of, this, of sparse relations. Okay. okay. Uh, again, you, ca you can find this as a footnote in this work. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, um, yeah, so okay. what? What we also know is that there are some protocols uh, where if we uh, want to work in some idealized model, for example, the generic group model, then we can show that a very simple function, uh, in, in this case, uh, addition model of some finite field, um, is sufficient for, fiat, uh, for a sound fiat Shamir. But this, uh, uh, um, uh, this approach doesn't go th uh, 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 through uh, correlation interactability, okay? It uses uh, properties of these specific uh, protocols uh, 
for example, Schnorr's uh, identification scheme and uh, uh, other cases of uh, useful protocols. Uh, good. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So let's rephrase our uh, questions uh, accordingly. So again, I want to ask whether one-way functions are sufficient for useful classes of relations, because otherwise I don't care. And my second question is going to be the following. Is symmetric cryptography necessary for sound fiat Shamir over any given specific protocol? So I know if my goal is to construct universal fiat Shamir, then I do need cryptography. But this doesn't mean that if my goal is to construct a hash function for some given protocol, uh, then it's not clear whether this requires cryptography. Okay. So uh, perfect. Um, so we give uh, answers to both of these questions uh, using a fully black box separation between correction interactable hash and one way functions. So first of all, we show that there are no fully black box constructions of correlation interactability from uh, even from one way permutations. So this is even stronger than one way functions. And we also show that there are no fully black box constructions of one way functions from correlation interactability. And not, this correlation interactability suffices for fiat Shamir for any given protocol. Uh, and it's not clear what's, what interesting means here, but the separation I'm going to show is going to apply even for very weak correlation interactability, which is uh, very far from what we uh, need for applic applications right now. Okay, so what we need for applications right now uh, contain, for, for example, all sub, uh, efficiently computable relations or uh, relations that you can represent uh, using some decryption algorithm. Uh, and this separation holds for uh, correlation interactability for relations that can be uh, described as, as a three degree polynomial, polynomials. So this is a very simple class of relations. So I see a, que a question here in the chat, um, but I don't see the chat, wait. Uh, hey, hi. Um, so black box as in black box in protocol or black box in simulation? Uh, what do you mean protocol or simulation in this matter? I mean, uh, protocol as in you can use the one way, like uh, you can compute the garbage, uh, one way function inside a garbage circuit, right? So that will be black box in protocol. Um, right, so, okay, so you're talking about the uh, protocol over which we're applying Fiat Shamir. Uh, no, I'm trying to construct a correlation in actual hash from one way function. So suppose if I have a CI hash, where mm -hmm. you compute a one way function using a garbage circuit. So that is non black box in the one way function, right? Uh, no, so so this is the strictest form of uh, black box black boxness. I'm going to define this uh, in few slides. If uh, if I haven't answered you uh, by then, then please let me know. Okay. Okay. Sure. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, speaking ahead. It's gonna. It, so we have right every construction of uh, every cryptographic construction consists of a construction and a reduction, a security reduction. So I do require that both the construction and the reduction are black box. Okay. Okay. Both in the adversary that you're given and in the base primitive. So yeah, the, 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 the most black box notion you can think about. Okay. It's black box only. Okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, perfect. Cool. So, um, okay, let's continue. So, okay, so let's, uh, 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 let me tell you what, uh, how do I answer uh, the questions I just told you. So, okay, so what this separation says is that when we functions are probably not sufficient for constructing correlation interactable hash, at least not in a black box way. And uh, as for the other question, then what this separation shows is if you take any proof system, any, you take your favorite proof system, then there exists a world on the, relative to some uh, oracle where there exists some Fiat Shamir over this protocol you gave me, but there are no one-way functions. And this means that one-way functions do not uh, apply, uh, do not imply um, sound Fiat Shamir for any protocol you'd give me, uh, at least not, to, not relative to any uh, idealized world. Cool. 
Um, so now that uh, I gave you some motivation, we talked about correlation tractability and Fiat Shamir. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about fully black box separations. And then I probably have time only to show this direction, uh, but let's hope that, uh, okay, let, let's, let's, just, uh, let's, let's just start and see. Cool. So, okay, so fully black box separations are just a statement that says that fully black box constructions don't exist. So what is a fully black box construction? A fully black box construction of a cryptographic primitive P from a, a, a cryptographic primitive Q. So I'm trying to construct uh, uh, to take a base primitive Q and uh, get P uh, consists of two things. So first of all, I need the construction. So a construction is typically uh, an algorithm or a circuit, and it has a black box a black box access to any uh, instantiation of Q, and it has to satisfy the properties required by P. So for example, if we're talking about uh, constructing uh, correlation tractability from one-way functions, then the construction is simply an, impl an, impl an implementation of a hash function that uses a, a one-way function in black box way. Good. Uh, and as it goes in uh, uh, all cryptographic constructions, we also need a security reduction in order to prove our security. Um, and we also require that our reduction is black box here. So the reduction has black box access to any adversary that breaks our construction. So A breaks the construction of P. And it has access to the base primitive on which the construction is based. And its goal is to break the base primitive. And if we show that given any adversary that breaks uh, the construction, then the reduction breaks the base primitive then we can base our uh, security of the construction on, our, on, the, on the security of uh, Q on the base primitive, okay? So what this says is that um, unless uh, Q is broken, then our construction is secure. This is very standard. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. So does the adversary also get black box access to Q? Um, yes. So uh, yeah. Okay. So, has that much access to you. Also, Tamar, um, is, is the um, do you consider um, correlation tractable functions which are bounded the normal time? I mean, it's the ones that you know that uh, uh, you know there is some class of relations and the construction itself is uh, polynomially. You know, the complexity of the construction is polynomial in the uh, complexity of the relations. You see, uh, you consider this case, are you, do you consider this case also? The complexity of the relation? So again, so, so there's this uh, uh, correlation tractable functions for bounded polynomial time relations, right? So they, you need to have a bound on the complexity of the relation and then the, you know, the hash function is kind of more complex than the, than the relation. Um, um, so yeah, so in the uh, so uh, this is interesting in the direction where we want to say that correlation tractable hash for strong relations uh, do not imply one-way functions, right? Right, right. You want to say that, uh, right? You want to say even uh, the question if if uh, are you saying these are weaker? So uh, no, but but right now you want to show that you cannot construct uh, correlation tractable hash functions in a black box way from one of the functions, right? No, so let me also discuss the other direction. Uh, so ideally I would want to uh, um, start with this for the separation to be strongest. I, okay. uh, I want to start to, to start with the strongest uh, notion of correlation tractability. So yeah, so I want to, I'm going to show that correlation tractability for any sparse relation uh, regardless of its complexity, uh, does not uh, uh, imply one with functions, uh, but I'm going to assume, of course, I'm gonna rule out efficient constructions, so. Okay, okay. Cool, any other questions? Okay. I'm, I'm gonna show you an example of this, so if it's super abstract right now. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, cool. okay, so how do we rule out fully black box constructions? So I'm going to talk about a very useful uh, method that's been in the literature for a while. It's called the two oracle method. 
I says the following. So our goal again is to show that constructions uh, from Q to P do not exist. So this method, method says the following. Construct two oracles, Q and A, where A is some very powerful adversary that breaks any construction of the target primitive P. Okay? So I have this very power, powerful adversary which breaks any construction of P. And this oracle Q is some, uh, an, some ideal instantiation of the base primitive Q. And my requirement is that, first of all, that A breaks any instantiation of P. But on the other hand, it does not give you the ability to break Q, my ideal instantiation of Q. Okay, let's again take the, our example. So we want to show this when we functions don't uh, apply correlation tractable hash. So what A has to do is to break any correlation tractable hash. So A has to find correlations. But on the other hand, I want to show you some ideal instantiation of a one-way permutation which is still one way, even if you're given the ability to find correlations using A. And what does this mean? This means that under these two oracles, first of all, P does not exist because I have this very powerful adversary that breaks any construction of P. But on the other hand, because I showed you an ideal instantiation of Q, which is still a secure under A, then there exists Q, right? So this is under the oracle A and Q. So I showed you a world where there is Q, but there's no P. So this clearly means that Q cannot imply P, at least not in a black box way. Right? Mm -hmm. Any questions? So let's imagine that we have a fully black box construction. So this construction is broken by the adversary A, but you cannot prove this the security of this construction in a black box way because there exists no reduction that breaks uh, uh, the base primitive Q, even given your, your adversary that breaks the construction, uh, your candidate construction. And the way I at least think about it is again, I created a world where there's no instantiation of P, but there's some instantiation of Q. And this means that Q does not imply P because uh, I have an instantiation, an instantiation of Q, which uh, does not imply any construction of uh, P. Um, yes. Any questions regarding that? This is this is going to be my formal framework for the uh, for the talk today. If cool, okay. So yeah, I'm gonna continue. So, okay, fully black box separations are super insightful. Uh, and the reason is that most uh, constructions in crypto, at least in basic cryptography that we know are fully black box. Our reduction usually is usually very black box, right? Uh, it, it, has a, it, it doesn't use uh, the implementation of the adversary it's given, neither the implementation of the base primitive especially when we're talking about one way functions and stuff like that. So, but still they are not, uh, they're not uh, definitive separations. So let's just understand what they do give us and what they don't because this can be very subtle sometimes. So again, like I said, they do not rule out any construction of P from Q. What they do, they rule out any, any fully black box construction. And what this means is that we either have to use uh, black box techniques or um, uh, we need to base our construction on some stronger primitive. And if we want to talk about the relation between the complexity of these two primitives that we're working with, then again, fully black box separations, they do not uh, tell us nothing about uh, the relation between the true complexity of the primitives, because typically this is uh, hard to prove, right? We don't know how to show that there exist one-way functions. Uh, or that there are no one with functions. But what, what they uh, do tell us, these separations, is that um, is how these uh, two primitives or two notions uh, interplay in some uh, world re relative to some oracle. Okay? 
Cool. So let's uh, okay. Let's start with uh, the first direction of the separation. So my goal now is to show you that one-way functions, or even stronger, one-way permutations, uh, do not um, imply correlation tractability for interesting classes of relations. So again, let's go back to the two oracle, two oracle method for uh, uh, separation. And now we have concrete uh, a concrete image in mind. We know that we want to separate correlation tractability from one-way permutations. So my goal is as follows. I want to show you a, an adversary that breaks any correlation tractable hash, and I'm going, I'm going to call it the correlation finder. So again, under A, under the correlation finder, there are no correlation tractable hash. And on the other hand, I want to show you some ideal one-way permutation, which I'm going to call F, which is still one way, even if I give you uh, access to this correlation finder. And just as a note, the construction of uh, or both A and F, they do not have, they, they don't have to be uh, efficient, okay? It's sufficient to give you some uh, oracle or to describe to you some oracle, but because we require, we want to rule out black box uh, constructions, which should not care about the implementation, then th this is sufficient for us. And indeed, the adversary A and the uh, one-way permutation F will not have an efficient implementation. There will be some idealization of an adversary and a one-way permutation. Good. So again, this shows that under F and A, there are no correlation tractable hash, but there exist one-way permutations. And this means that one-way permutations do not imply correlation tractability in a black box way. Good. Um, our, our start point for the proof is going to be uh, a known separation uh, that separates uh, CRH from one-way permutation. So collision resistant hash. So now my goal is not to construct an adversary that breaks any correlation tractable hash, but rather that breaks any CRH. So I don't want a correlation finder, I want a collision finder. So I do want a collision finder and a one-way permutation, which is secure under the collision finder. Good. So, okay, so th this, uh, this separation has been proved in, uh, in, in a few works, uh, already starting in uh, 98. But there have been many nice proofs that use uh, different techniques. Uh, but let me start with telling you how all proofs uh, begin. So again, my goal is to show a collision finder and a one-way permutation under this collision finder. So the goal of my collision finder is to break any, any CRH. And what this means, so my adversary is given some hash function, C. So C is a circuit that implements some hash function with black, black box access to uh, my one-way permutation F. And its goal is to find two inputs that collide, that give you the same hash value. And the collision finder is going to work as follows. It's going to sample a random input in the uh, domain, Z1. And this Z1 is going to give you some hash value. And this immediately, immediately defines a set of, uh, uh, of inputs that collide with Z1, right? So any uh, input in this set, which gives the same hash value, is a, a, a relevant is, is an eligible answer together with, with uh, Z1 as a collision. So what the collision finder is going to do is simply to sample uh, an input from this set, uh, which we're going to denote by Z2, and he outputs Z1 and Z2. So clearly, this collision finder breaks any uh, CRH, right? Good. Uh, and this collision finder, it satisfies a very important property. So notice that the marginal distribution of both Z1 and Z2 is uniform. So if we look only at Z1 or only at Z2, then we see uniform distribution. This is super clear for Z1, but it's not so hard to see uh, for Z2, okay? Because what I essentially do here is sample a random output and then sample a random free image. Good. And notice that not any collision finder would work with this proof. We do need this important property. So uh, for example, if I would uh, just uh, output the uh, uh, smallest collision lexicographically, then my proof will not work. Okay, so now I have a collision finder which satisfies this important property. 
And now I want to show you a one-way permutation, which is still one way under this CR, uh, under this collision finder. And uh, let's uh, let's be safe and choose the strongest one-way permutation we can think of, which is simply a random permutation. Okay, so I define f as a random permutation. It's simply a random function. A random permutation. Sorry. Um, so now my goal is to show that uh, f is still one way under the collision finder. And notice that uh, f is one way if I don't give you any extra help. The question here is whether giving you the ability to find collisions gives you the ability to invert a random function. So my goal now is to show that any efficient reduction which is given access to f and this collision finder cannot invert f. And up to this point, all of these proofs, they follow the same uh, outline, uh, but we're going to focus on this work by Bitansky and uh, Debwakar, which says the following. Because the uniform, uh, the, uh, the answers of a collision finder have uniform marginal distributions, then any such reduction can essentially simulate these distributions without even calling uh, the collision finder. Because it's simply a uniform distribution, then the reduction can simply sample random inputs. And because it can simulate the answers of a collision finder, then at least intuitively, whatever it can do, it can do without the help of the collision finder. And we know that without the help of the collision finder, no reduction can uh, invert F. This was very high level. I'm going to dive into the details very soon. Uh, but are there any questions before I do that? Okay. Okay, so let's assume we do have a, redu a reduction R, which has access to a collision finder and a random permutation and can invert this, this random permutation. So it's given a random uh, uh, image Y and its goal is to find X such that F of X is equal to Y, okay? So let's assume we have such a, an efficient reduction. And by efficient, I mean a reduction that makes polynomially many queries to, uh, to its oracles. Good. Um, so what, this, what does this reduction do? It, uh, it asks both its oracles uh, some queries and it gets some answers. And if we take a look about uh, on the uh, queries uh, that it sends to the collision finder, then they're simply circuits that represent hash function. And the answers are collisions. So uh, any couple of these Zs, they're a collision under the corresponding uh, circuit. And again, let's recall the, the marginal distribution of these uh, uh, answers is uniform. So these have uniform marginals. And the idea is as follows. I'm claiming, and I hope that you can believe me at least uh, uh, on, the intuitive, on the intuition level, that in order for the collision finder to help you invert a totally random permutation, then you, it, it should help you to actually see X. And by that, I mean one of, the, of these uh, answers when evaluated under this circuit, it should call X. Again, I'm going to repeat. The only way that the collision finder can help you is if one of its answers under the corresponding circuit, so if this evaluation, it queries X. Notice that this uh, circuits, they have uh, Oracle access to F, so they make some calls to F during the evaluation. And I'm, I'm going to call uh, an input to F. So I'm going to call X to be heavy under some circuit if what I just said happens with high probability. So I'm going to say that X is heavy under any of these queries if with high probability, I'm going to see it when I evaluate the circuit on one of the answers. Uh this is Leo. Can I ask a question? Yes. 
so that's a very bold claim. You're basically saying that the only way the collision finder can help you is that if you evaluate the circuit, <clears throat> then at some point you will see X explicitly. Yes. What if you evaluate the circuit or evaluate two circuits, in fact, one for Z1 and one for Z2, you will see two values that X or to X. Okay, so this, the claim I just said, it's, uh, it wasn't easily proven. It goes through a hybrid argument, but let me try and uh, just convince you. Notice that the random permut the permutation you, you, ha you have to invert is, is random. You're given Y and the X you have to find is, if you don't look at anything, it's independent of Y, right? Right. And even if you see all, uh, uh, right, if you see the truth table of F except for the for X, then again, I mean, given it's a permutation, then you can figure out it's X. But what I want to uh, say is that if you see polynomially many uh, uh, queries, then you have no idea what's the preimage of Y. Correct. And, and, and let me tell you a bit about this hybrid argument, what they uh, essentially do is that they switch to a hybrid where X is removed from the collision finder. So they switch to a scenario where the collision finder will not give you anything if by any chance uh, this Z calls X. And then they show that these two hybrids are indistinguishable. And once you've removed the X out of the game, you can kind of manipulate F so that Y is totally independent of X. You can switch the game to a game where R is given Y prime. And then clearly you can you cannot invert because you know nothing about X. Mm -hmm. But again, intuitively, unless I give you explicitly X, you, you, you don't have any information about X because uh, the permutation F is random. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so but the, I agree. This is very high level. Like, uh, I think it's, it's kind of lazy something, right? I couldn't. You could say it's a lazy something idea. I mean, this X could have been anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, but I agree. It's uh, it's not uh, not straightforward, and these guys worked really hard to show it. It's not Right. No, Ron, I agree with lazy sampling. What bothers me is I don't understand quite why you can't just feed X uh, surreptitiously one bit at a time, which is sort of what a collision finder could try to do, or a few bits at a time, or, or a secret shared. And what you're saying is there's a hybrid argument that sort of allows you to remove X, and then it's not even there, and then you can't feed it right. one bit at a time because it doesn't exist. Yeah. I think. You know, X is something that is not even well defined until you actually ask for it, right? In some sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, can I ask maybe a more elementary question? Because I think I'm yes. still like confused about the types of the things in the on the slide. So the queries to to a collision finder, these the C sub F, or C soup, uh, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. uh, what, like, what's the type of those things? Those are circuits that make their oracle circuits. These are circuits with uh, uh, oracle to uh, oracle access to F. And think, so the collision finder, you give it a hash, it finds a collision, right? So each of these circuits, it should represent some hash function uh, over which you require to, fi uh, uh, to find the collision, right? Uh, and yeah, so the Zs are taken from the domain of the hash, the collisions under each of these circuits. And X is taken from the domain of the random permutation. Hmm. I see, and now that, okay. So yeah, I don't care about, yeah. The, it just, just like the, the, the claim is that there aren't that many exit, uh, or it doesn't, maybe the claim is it doesn't matter that there aren't that many, but the X's that are heavy in this sense, they can be identified. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I haven't even comp uh, completed this, but if oh, an okay, X is great. heavy, <laughs> Yeah, what I claimed uh, is that the only way you can hope to invert um, um, your permutation is if, you, if the X you have to find is heavy under such a, a query that you make, um, um, right? And only then you can invert. And uh, so back to your uh, question, Leo, this is not like, right? Saying that this is the only way uh, it can help you it's right. You have to. You still have to construct a circuit under which X is heavy. So 
it's it's not clear that you cannot actually do that. So it's it's yeah, I, like. And okay, so I, I want to try and answer your question uh, question a bit differently. Imagine that you could, then you could, you could construct a circuit where X is heavy, right? You can just mm -hmm. call uh, X at any input. So, right, if you found it, then you can generate an X which is heavy, so. Right. Okay, 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 that, that's helpful, yeah. Yeah, this is pretty, uh, yeah, I, this is the first time I use this uh, argument, actually. It's pretty convincing, I think. I yeah. Um, okay, so what was what what did I want to say that if x is such a heavy x under some query, so if there is some query that can possibly help you find the free image, then you can actually detect x without even making this query. And how would you do that? So again, these answers that you're given they distribute uh, uniformly; their marginal distribution is uniform. So you can actually simulate this uh, distribution. So what the reduction is going to do before making any query to the collision finder, it's simply uh, gonna sample a bunch of inputs, a bunch of Zs, and then it's gonna uh, evaluate uh, the circuit on all of these Zs. And these evaluations are going to, uh, uh, right? They're going to call F on some Xs. And my claim um, is that if X is heavy, then you will probably see X among, among, of, among these uh, uh, evaluations, right? It's, it's basic probability. Uh, if X uh, appears uh, frequently, if you uh, sample a random, a uniformly random input, then you can kind of detect it by sampling random inputs. Convincing, or should I repeat this? Again, if you'd expect uh, X to uh, appear frequently uh, uh, here, then you'd expect X to uh, appear frequently here also. Cool, so I can detect heavy Xs, and these are the only uh, case where I can be helped by the collision finder. So what, what, how, how does the proof go? I say if the reduction indeed inverts the permutation, then I can simulate it using a different reduction that still inverts the function, but that has no heavy uh, x's under its queries. And the way I'm gonna do that is by replacing my queries with queries where I hardwire the x's I detect. So again, I detect um, a bunch of X's and each of these X's, they map to some uh, image under F. So this C hat, it's not going, so I'm going to uh, write uh, what I know uh, uh, here inside C hat. And now whenever C hat wants to call F with one of these X's, it first is go it's, it's going to uh, read what it has first and if it finds one, uh, it, it, if it finds the uh, query uh, it wanted to make, then it doesn't make the query, it just takes the value from the hardware. What this means, this means that C hat is never going to call these X's, uh, it's, it's never gonna call F with these X's, and we know that all heavy X's are there, so C hat is not going to call any heavy X. So given a reduction that inverts uh, F, I constructed a reduction that inverts F, but its uh, evaluation doesn't induce any heavy inputs. And I'm going to call uh, such a reduction smooth. Okay, so a reduction is smooth because no X is heavy under any of the queries that a reduction makes to the collision finder. And from uh, the, uh, the discussion we just had, uh, I hope you're somehow, somehow convinced that a smooth reduction cannot invert a random permutation because it doesn't see any heavy X. So yeah, okay, so any, uh, for any X, the reduction has a negligible probability to see this X explicitly. And therefore, yeah. yeah. So, so why do you need to even do that? Isn't it enough to say that there are the, the only few heavy X's and therefore the probability that, you know, the X that you need to invert is heavy is small and that's it? That there are few heavy X's? Um, because how can, I, how can I do that? 
So, so I thought that was part you needed that in order to to uh, hardwire all the heavy access. Or not? You no, say so, okay, so, so notice that uh, this N is going to be uh, uh, super polynomial. It's going to be large. Uh, so you're saying my reduction is then uh, not efficient. Right. But no, but uh, I'm trying to invert the random permutation, and I can claim that even a reduction that works uh, that makes exponentially many queries, if this, this component is small enough, then it still cannot invert the permutation. I see. For the uh, for this claim to work, that heavy uh, implies detectable, n has to be uh, exponential. Big n. I see. Okay. okay. You got it. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, okay, um, so again, to recap, because the answers of the collision finder have marginal uh, dis uh, marginal distributions that are uniform, then any X which is heavy is also detectable, and therefore uh, we can claim that uh, you cannot invert a random permutation. What happens when I want to separate correlation tractable hash from one-way functions? Now A needs to be a correlation finder, not a collision finder. So these Zs, we have, we're gonna have a single Z each time, but it's, it's gonna be a correlation because this is what we need from a correlation finder. But notice that the distribution of a, cor a, cor a correlation cannot be uniform because it's a correlation. So what's gonna happen is that we have a domain of a function and there's this small set of correlations and the answer must be in this set. So it cannot possibly be a random input. And this is where uh, things start to be different. So my goal now is to create some notion of heaviness. And uh, remember, heaviness is defined is defined with respect to the oracle. You know, in this case, uh, the oracle would return uniform inputs, and therefore, a heavy input is a hint, is uh, an input which is called uh, frequently if I start with a random z. But I should be able to design a correlation finder where heavy inputs mean detectable inputs. Cool. So let's uh, start and try to construct a correlation finder. Okay, so now again, our goal uh, is to attack correlation detectability for some relation class. So I want that my correlation finder, given a hash function and the key, returns a correlation. This means an input Z such that Z and the output of the hash under the key satisfy some relation in the class. So given the function, let's try a very natural thing first. So let's choose some relation in the class R. So this immediately defines a set of correlations. So these are the blue dots, okay? The blue dots are all Zs that satisfy this thing. So these are my um, my legitimate answers. I had to choose one of them. So let's simply uh, sample a random correlation. Again, I choose a relation and then I sample a random correlation. Okay. My one-way permutation candidate is still going to be a random permutation because again, this is the strongest one-way permutation I can think of. So now my question is whether a one way, a random permutation is still one way under the correlation finder. What do you think? So clearly not, but uh, like, I don't know. Is there, can you think about a simple attack? Okay, so the idea for the attack is to somehow create a hash uh, function, a circuit where giving you the ability to find correlations under this circuit will give you the ability to invert the function. So I want to somehow um, align between correlations and pre-images of some image. And this means that if I can find a correlation, then I probably can find the pre-image. So let's uh, propose this uh, simple attack. Uh, I'm going to construct a circuit which takes Z and outputs some W in the relation with, with Z only if F on Z is equal to Y. So the circuit is going to look like that. If F of Z equals to Y, make Z a correlation. 
And, and notice that this is possible whenever R is uh, efficiently computable. Whenever it's efficiently, comp uh, it's efficient to compute a W such that Z and W are in a relation, and this is satisfied by uh, simple relation classes. So, 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 so uh, how is R chosen? The class R, I mean, is so the class R is going to uh, say what's my separation result, right? So. Um, I'm speaking ahead is going to be uh, three degree uh, degree three polynomials, uh, but I have to choose a relation to attack, right? Okay. For now, I'm choosing an arbitrary relation. But for example, if you're talking about uh, degree three polynomials, then any relation that you choose, you can attack, right? Uh, using this, uh, and even though the uh, our inverter does not know which relation that the uh, a correlation finder chose, it can always kind of learn it, right? If we're talking about simple classes of relations. So our solution is not going to go through uh, that. Any other questions? I see that I'm short in time. I'll try to uh, wrap up uh, quickly. Okay, so, and, and what happened here? Notice that, like I said, all the pre-images of Y are exactly the correlations. So notice that, Y is heavy because all correlations, they call Y. If I sample an answer from the correlation finder, I'll probably see Y. I will definitely see Y actually in this example. So Y is heavy, but Y is not detectable. So I don't have this uh, relation between detectability and heaviness. And this, this is what I'm trying to solve here. So my uh, the idea here is to avoid uh, uh, queries that are heavy, but are not detectable. So my second attempt is going to be exactly the same, but I'm going to abort. The correlation finder is going to abort if it's if the answer it was about to give calls a query which is heavy but not detectable. This is inefficient to check, but it can be checked, and I don't care about efficiency, like I said, for the correlation finder. Cool. So again, I sample random correlation. If it calls a bad Y, I'm gonna abort. And let's just see an example. So I'm going to sample, so I have two uh, values of, of Y. One of them is heavy, like uh, you can see. So there are many red X's on the blue dots, whereas the green Y is not heavy. So there's really few X's on the blue dot. So what's gonna happen is the correlation finder is going to sample a correlation out of this set, but it's going to abort anytime it falls out of this set. So whenever it falls on a blue dot, which calls uh, the red Y, it's going to abort. So let's, uh, okay, so, so I guess you're somewhat convinced that if I don't have uh, heavy queries, then uh, I do have a one-way permutation. And this is indeed the case here because I kind of abort on any heavy query, but we have a different problem. It's not clear that this correlation finder actually breaks any correlation tractable hash because it's sometimes abort now. So now we need to analyze the abortion probability of this correlation finder. And if we take a look, so if we choose the relation R arbitrarily, and if we fix a relation R for any circuit, then notice that using the same example, then the correlation finder cannot possibly find a correlation for this circuit, because whenever it finds a correlation, this correlation calls a heavy input, so it's going to abort. It's, it's, it never go, it's, it's never going to be, uh, it's, it's never going to return a correlation. But notice that this circuit is, prob is problematic for uh, some relation R. So the main observation is that it cannot be problematic for many relations in the class. If our class is sufficiently expressive, I'm not requiring a very expressive class. Again, uh, degree three polynomials are sufficient for the proof to work. So I'm going to, I'm trying to trick my bad example here. I'm going to sample a random relation for my circuit. I notice that, that the relation I sample, it's not dependent on K. It, it depends only on C. Because recall that in the correlation interactability uh, game, the adversary need to, first of all, uh, commit to a relation given the uh, hash function. And only then he sees the key. So the relation cannot depend on the key. If it could, then our uh, task would have been very simple. So sample a relation, then given the circuit and the key, sample a correlation, and uh, if we call a heavy but an undetectable uh, Y, then just abort. 
Okay, so what we want to prove basically is that uh, all queries which are made by this evaluation are uh, which which are non-detectable are probably not heavy over the randomness of choosing a relation. So, okay, I'm going to just say the high level and then I'm going to finish. So intuitively, if the relation behaved really nicely, if the set of correlation is uh, simply a random subset, then I would uh, imagine that the set of correlation would estimate how frequently a query is made, right? So if a query is not detectable, if it doesn't appear very frequently in the domain, then it probably doesn't appear too frequently in the set of correlations because this subset is random, right? Uh, and what, uh, what the Chebyshev's uh, concentration bound uh, tell us is that we don't need this very uh, uh, super assumption about the uh, subset behaving uh, uh, like a random subset. We only need that the uh, events of uh, pairs being in the relation. So we want that if we take two pairs, Z1 and W1 and Z2, W2, then that the events that these two pairs in the relation we only need that they are uh, pairwise independent. Okay, so from pairwise independence, we get that uh, any non-detectable query is not heavy, with high probability, of course. But again, this is also not uh, sufficient because we can apply lower bound over all queries, but it's it's going to be uh, too much. Uh, and this is because um, so notice that the heaviness notion it's. It's uh, dependent on the relation, and uh, this relation is sampled before we sample uh, correlation Z, but a simple trick where we replace the order of sampling in our analysis. So now we first sample a, a totally random input and only then sample a relation conditioned on the fact that Z is a correlation. Uh, then, uh, uh, and if we start uh, with, uh, so, okay, so, so uh, th this, um, uh, this will help us to apply uh, uh, the upper the uh, union bound on um, on, a, on only polynomially many queries because once z is fixed then this evaluation is fixed. But notice that now we sample a relation from a different distribution, the distribution which conditions uh, that z is a correlation. But if we start with a three-wise independent class of relations, then such distributions are pairwise independent uh, and are good for Chebyshev. Okay, so this is the idea. Uh, so again, we get that for three wise independent relations, for example, uh, degree three polynomials, uh, there's uh, this correlation uh, finder breaks any correlation trackable hash, although uh, a random permutation is one way under this correlation finder. So our separation holds for any relation class that contains, for example, uh, degree three polynomials. And this is a very, a very weak uh, requirement compared to what's known uh, to be useful, for example, for NISX. Cool, so I finished talking about this direction. I don't have time to uh, talk about the other one, um, but I don't know, uh, there are like many open questions left here. So, so now we know we cannot construct correlation ability from only functions. What about CRH or public key. Do we do we need this homomorphism in FHE in order to get correlation tractability? It's not clear. I believe that we uh, uh, we do need this uh, kind of functionality. So a separation should be possible, but uh, yeah. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, then. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tamir. Yeah.